What is up, everybody? This is the Sharp Angles podcast. I'm your host, Raymond Summerlin, and I'm joined by my good friend, a man who will be spending Thursday mornings with me for the foreseeable future, all the way into, into January, and that is that is Mr. Rich Rebard at Lord's Reeves himself, the Swami of Konami. How you doing, my friend? We're doing good. Yeah, it's funny when you lay that out. But, uh, I always knew that this was coming, right? You know, post Fourth of July, I give you because you're, yeah. you're you know you're the the, the dutiful editor, editor here, you know, and you see the calendar of all the things planned out. And it's like, yep, I'm doing stuff every day from here until basically the end of the season. Now we're locked in. You know, we're we're here. I always. You know, it, it sneaks up on you a little bit, especially since mm -hmm. we do the preview book. And so I'm I'm so focused in June and the early part of July, making sure, you know, we get the preview book done and everybody's got everything in and we're where we're supposed to be. And you think, oh, I'm going to get a nice little respite here. I'm going to get a nice little break. And then, nope, it kicks you in the face. I won't <laughs> lie to you. I have not been productive for the last two days because my brain, my brain had decided that it was out. But now it's now it's back. Now I got to hit the grind and the groove today. I do mention we are going to these Thursday shows are normal Thursday morning shows, 1130 Eastern. We're, these are going to be regular moving forward as we move through, you know, fantasy football draft season and into the regular season. There might be a hiccup the, the first day in August. I'm going to be we were just talking about that. I'm going to be out of the country. Rich will be probably in New York City, but we'll figure it out. Someone will be in here. This Thursday morning podcast can be part of your part of your week so make sure you subscribe to the podcast channel subscribe on youtube you can watch us live all of all of that stuff as well also want to make mention of the preview the preview book warren sharp's preview book i mentioned it just a, a little bit ago uh that is out it's available now we have early bird pricing for now it's five dollars off it's 29.99 that is not going to last so make sure that you go and check out the book if you want the book this is the best price you're going to get make sure you go and get it now you can go to sharpfootballanalysis.com sharp.football you can just google sharp football preview you will you will be able to find it the other thing you'll be able to find is the sharp fantasy football draft kit which is rich is just grinding away on on that his tiers his wide receiver tier quarterback tier running back tiers we're actually going to talk a little bit about those today that's available in there this week he's doing a really interesting series he does every week about league trends which uh i'm fascinated by we already have a couple of those up more will be going up today as we move forward a ton in that draft kit it's all rich rebar go and make sure you check it out i do want to talk a little bit can we just hit a little bit on the trends for just a second because i'm fascinated by i'm fascinated by the running back not getting targets behind the line of scrimmage part of, of what we released yesterday with the running backs, because you said it and it's something and you said you would expect based on what we've seen with teams throwing more behind the line of scrimmage of teams, you know, attacking the shorter areas of the field that we would begin to see running backs getting a larger share of the targets. And that's just not what we've seen. And it's fascinating to me. And I, I guess it's because coaches are now, smarter and they realize that those kind of those running back dump off targets are not actually good targets like targeting the running back in those ways is not really great or at least it hasn't been if i'm remembering correctly from research that i saw you know three or four years ago is that what we're seeing like what what do you attribute this to that even while we're seeing fewer and fewer passes you know 10 and 15 yards downfield we're not seeing more and more running back targets yeah, it is interesting dynamic, and I think it definitely ties into obviously like the mobile quarterbacks too, right? Like the influx of athletic sure. quarterbacks. Uh, pull, you know, we're just not getting as many as many checkdowns to the running backs. Running back targets per game have dropped from the season prior now in six consecutive seasons, and we're also seeing something. You know, not to spoil the remaining two, you know, articles that are coming out the rest of this week: wide receivers and tight ends. Yeah. We're seeing that teams have made a concentrated effort now of getting the ball in the passing game to like their actual best pass catchers. There was like an inflection point where the NFL expanded to like a lot more three wide receiver being the base set for offenses where it, that was hurting wide receiver ones and like lead lead wide receivers, like the targets were getting like more spread out and it's actually gone the opposite direction. And we started to see offenses become more concentrated the last few years. And teams have really kind of focused on getting the ball to their best players as much as possible. And we're seeing more shorter wide receiver targets, more of like wide receivers in the quick game, wide receiver screens are more prevalent, even tight ends in like the screen game and targets behind the line of scrimmage, the tight ends, those have gone up from like a decade ago. 
So it, it is an interesting dynamic because you would say, like, when you look at the defensive meta, like a lot more zone coverage, they want, they're trying to invite teams to run the football. And the NFL has tried to run the football the past years. 2022, they did it successfully. Last year, not so much. But this ongoing trend of just running backs continuing to lose production in the receiving game and then top down production as well, like, because we're getting more quarterbacks running the football in the running game. So as a default, we're getting less carries for running backs as well. It's just like this push and pull for running backs. And it's just running back production just continues to kind of shrink and dwindle down. And it's really hurt fantasy in, in totality. We only have like very, a very finite group of like alpha running backs now. Like we almost have like cheat code running backs. Like you have Christian McCaffrey and then we have like a little mini tier of Brees Hall and Bijan Robinson. And then it's like an immediate gap where like you start just like poking holes in guys like Jameer Gibbs has basically been the consensus RB4 and completely shares a backfield, which is something that wouldn't have happened like a decade ago. Not around here, partner. Not around here. Uh, <laughs> but no, like I, I'm actually perfectly fine with where Jameer Gibbs is because like I can't make an argument. There was like I think about Josh Jacobs, right? And I look at Josh Jacobs as the RB12. I believe this is where he is in underdog leagues mm -hmm. right now, underdog drafts. And I'm like, that seems way too high. And then I look behind him and I go, I, okay, I guess. Like, it's just wild kind of where we are with with running backs. And it's also interesting. I actually did my first draft at FFPC so far this season. I'm in the middle of it now. And it's such a departure from what I've been mm -hmm. drafting at Underdog for two months now. And that we see those running backs get shoved way up the board. I was picking from the five spot. And I ended up with Tyree Kill, Chris Olave, and Devontae Adams, which would literally never happen at an underdog draft. And so going to these different sites and seeing kind of these different drafts and the way running backs are treated, it's really interesting as well. And I think that if you're someone who recognizes outside of those top three running backs, kind of the limitations that exist, and you find yourself at a site that is not recognizing those limitations that exist, mm -hmm. then it certainly becomes, it becomes much more profitable to draft there. And so it's, it's an interesting thing I've been, I've been thinking about a little bit. Another thing, and you brought this up that I've been thinking about because I actually uh, wrote the Lions fantasy chapter for, for the, for the preview book, again, early bird pricing right now, 29.99. And you brought it up and I really wanted to talk about it was Sam Laporta versus Travis Kelsey for, for tight in one. And I think that this is a really interesting discussion because I don't think either of us has like a strong argument against either of these players. I, I would suspect that both of us like these players and think they're, mm -hmm. they're good players being drafted probably around where they should be. But I think Laporta is very interesting based on maybe him out kicking his coverage a little bit last year, especially in the touchdown department and how big of a role touchdowns played in his scoring last year. And I wonder if we're slightly overvaluing him as a result of that. And I'll give you an example. So Sam Laporta in half PPR leagues, if you take touchdowns out of the equation, that's a filter that I have on true media that I love, where I just remove touchdowns and I look at scoring. Sam Laporta was the TE six and half PPR scoring per game last year when touchdowns are taken out of the equation. And then you go and look at expected touchdown numbers and you head over to, I use PFF. I like PFFs expected numbers. And he scored 3.2 more touchdowns than expected. And you put both of those things together. And he was young. He was a rookie. He had a great rookie season. He's a great prospect. We would expect him to improve. He had a very impressive target per route rate, especially considering he was playing next to Amon Ross St. Brown, who was a, you know, a target hog and a target monster and all of those things put together i go he's probably going to get better it's probably mm -hmm. fine where he's being drafted but that touchdown thing worries me a little bit and i'm i think i've i'm more on the kelsey side of if i had to take one of these two tight ends i'm not taking either to be fair where they are right. but if i had to take either of these tight ends i think i'm taking kelsey and that touchdown thing i think is is that 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 factor for me that really changes it where, where are you at yeah, I think just by default of like just betting on like career arc, there's like, you know, it's hard to push back on, you know, the 23 year old guy versus the 35 Absolutely. year old guy. Right. Yep. And that's why he, he he's there. And I, I've talked a lot about the Lions, you know, and their schedule, you know, basically they, they play one outdoor game the first 13 weeks of the season. They, uh, he has by far our, our highest projected, you know, passing schedule for any tight end we have ranked as a tight end one. I think like when you're splitting hairs, it's like that. I think the conversation becomes more interesting though. Like when do you take the tight end one this year as opposed to previous years? I mean, last yeah. year, last year we saw that like when Travis Kelsey became mortal, 
and was no longer like on this like run where he had like an Antonio Brown like esque like dominance at the position. Like it was just a lot more flatter, and we we saw that play out like in fantasy circles. I mean, you saw the the tight end four last year had ninety two percent of the production of the tight end one last season. The tight end nine had seventy four percent of the tight end one. That was the second highest rate over the past thirty years. So it became a lot flatter. I actually have both of these guys in overall rankings lower than where they even go in, yeah. in the, in these drafts earlier. I think that's probably the more interesting conversation. That's probably why I don't get many of them. I think you're better served. Just take wide receivers where the, where both of these guys are going, but I do think those things like splitting hairs, I have no pushback on anyone that likes Travis Kelsey more. I mean, we saw Travis Kelsey when he was healthy was still really good in the postseason last year. Uh, we've seen that we, a lot of people have talked about like the reduction in snaps for Travis Kelsey. And, you know, I did two at first and then I went under the hood and I just realized that like the snaps he wasn't playing didn't matter anyways. Uh, when Travis Kelsey was on the field, the Chiefs had a drop back rate of 70 percent of plays, which was number one in the NFL off the field is when they got him off. They said, we don't want you blocking. We don't want to waste your snaps here. And they had a drop back rate of only 51 percent, which would have been dead last in the NFL in context of Travis Kelsey didn't exist, which also wouldn't happen if Travis Kelsey didn't miss yeah. like a huge amount of time, but you get what you get my drift. The snaps aren't a big deal because they weren't throwing the ball anyways. So, I mean, that's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, um, I really have no push and pull. I'm probably just like gonna, like I said, bet on Laporta just based on career arc, but also, you know, draft Mark Andrews draft, you know, go down the road on these guys. Yeah, that's where I am. That's where I am as well. And I know I've, I knew the both of us would be there. Uh, I'm glad you shared that Kelsey stat about his snaps. That was one of the two stats I wanted you to share as we talked about this. The other one was you shared an interesting stat about uh, to be a tight end one, how how you have to be one of the top two targets mm -hmm. on your team and how often and how difficult it is to be a tight end one and not be the top two targets. Um, you know, we think about that in the context of someone like Dallas Goddard. And we've seen Dallas Goddard yep. really, not break out. really, he can't break out because of the two guys ahead of him. And I thought that was an interesting stat. Do you have that off the top of your head? How often it is? It's something like 75% of tight end ones or something like that are top two target, something, something wild. Well, that, that's the top score overall. If you're looking for someone to like break a ceiling, which often people don't really care about floor at tight end that much. It's like the George Kittle yeah. argument, right? Like, yeah, George Kittle's volatile, but like his spike weeks, like are very, they very much matter at the tight end position. Whereas like, do you care really when your tight end gets you six points? A lot of weeks are like that for a lot of teams. Uh, but yeah, the past 30 years, 22 of the 30 have been the top target in their offense. So right away, 22 to 30 have just been the, the number one targets. So that's a, a vote for Kelsey, right? Like versus yeah. Laporta. Because we know Laporta is probably not going to jump Amon Ra, uh, but not fall below, you know, tight end two. But that's also when you take into context, like a guy like George Kittle, you know, he's basically fighting that, that tier of guys that definitely project it worse to be two um, – if, if not one on their teams, you know, when you're talking about like the Trey McBrides of the world, you know, even potentially Evan Ingram, uh, but even Kyle Pitts, you know, is basically the top, the top two target on his team, Dalton Kincaid. Right. And then you start to get into some of those other guys that go down. Like, is that going to happen for David and Joku this year or Jerry Judy joining the roster? A lot of people have wanted to tear down Jake Ferguson, but like, that's my biggest hurdle of knocking Jake Ferguson down, who very much looks like a, like a ham and egger. Like he doesn't like a special dude, but like he was already, second on the Cowboys and targets last year, and they did nothing to get better <laughs> with the guys he already out-targeted. So how do you really knock him down a whole lot? It's one of the reasons why I'm so more optimistic on Bowers being a rookie, uh, so down on Goddard. Uh, and then also to go play like the flop lag game on a guy like Pat Fryermuth, right? Like Fryermuth was a guy I think let people down last year, definitely let me down, but again, projects to be the, the, the target number two on his offense pretty easily, right? So keeps the keep the keeps the train alive. But definitely when you're asking yourselves, the further you get into the tight end position and you want to take shots on guys like, you know, I've seen like Noah Fant get some steam. You want to ask yourself, like, one, where is this guy like in terms of career arc? And can you make a case for this guy to be a top two target in his offense? If your two top two answers are no and no to those, you've got to go to another player. Just move on to, the, to another player. I did just draft Noah Fant in, uh, in the Scott Fishbowl pretty late, to be fair. But right. I'm fair. I'm I'm happy with that. 
I'm not, I will not take your criticism, uh, Rich, of my of my no infinite love. Fair I enough, also am I am also am upset at the continued Roman Wilson erasure and Calvin Austin erasure that happens in, from from your mouth on this podcast. I'm I can't take it anymore. There it's, will be uh, more. It's unacceptable. <laughs> I figured there would be. Actually, interestingly enough, we want to talk a little bit about you know you you said and you know we were talking on Slack. Uh, after the after your tears came out again, those tears are available as part of the Sharp Football Draft Kit. Head over to sharpfootballanalysis.com. I will promise you about the tears that you will not find a more comprehensive breakdown of the quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end positions for fantasy than what Rich writes every year in the in the tears. I, I promise you that does not exist. Go and check those out. Put a, put aside a couple of days to read through them, and I promise you you're going to you're going to learn something. But as you were going through them, you, we talked about a few players that you that you moved up and moved down and we wanted to be positive today we're keeping the positivity going rich we're gonna talk about a few yeah. players that you moved up coming out of out of your tears and top of that list it's someone that you like hinted at me because you know i like this guy was george pickens uh mm -hmm. the number one we can agree outside of our roman wilson <laughs> discourse we can agree that george pickens is the number one target in that in that pittsburgh offense and what i thought was interesting about your write-up for him is what tier you put him in, the guys you put him around, and how you pointed out that his profile is similar to a lot of receivers that are going much higher than him in drafts this year. Yeah, 100%. And that's why I do the tiers by basically by archetype and, you know, kind of like, you know, career arc and stuff like that, because then it kind of illuminates some of those things you might not have caught, like on first run of projections or where you kind of like you set your initial rankings. And it, you don't necessarily have to move a guy like sky high up in the rankings, but just understand like this guy is available later. And if you miss out on these other guys in this tier, like he kind of fits the same profile of all these other guys we're like really excited about. I'm talking about guys like you know, even Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Drake London, especially like, I think he belongs in that tier, these year three wide receivers that are going to be the number one target in their offense. Now that we don't have Deontay Johnson, and we'll get into some of the splits for that a little bit, but you go back to Pickens too. And he was uh, like, he has all the pedigree. Like this dude was, you know, a, a four-star recruit to a major university. Uh, and he was a guy that I always look for how guys perform in big games. And like, he's a guy that like when, Georgia played in big games like George Pickens smashed. Like this is definitely a guy that that definitely should be getting I think more upside look in context of where we're already pricing it in for some of these other players like Alave and London. I I do so like like Wilson by far the most of all those guys, but uh, there's a wide gap from you know Pickens in that group, especially like a guy like Drake London who. I think especially when you look at the way drafts play out, if you're picking in like that back quadrant, which, man, I feel like I'm always in that back quadrant this year. Maybe it'll shift it's for me. Awful. Come on. It's come an on, awful place to be. Yeah. But I, I always feel better. Like when I get Pickens in like the fourth round in that area of the draft versus like London in the second round, I feel like Pickens is going to be like a lot more viable draft pick at that than it is just elevating London there at that point, which is interesting. But you look at last year, what all these guys did, and none of these guys had great situations, but London or Pickens had more yards per route run than Wilson and and London. He was just a tenth of a yard off of where Olave was. He had the highest inaccurate target rate of all of those guys, including Garrett Wilson, who we kind of you know, talk about his inaccurate target rate ad nauseum based on what he's had to deal with with you know the the vagabonds the Jets have carted out at QB. But then you look at then they, they lose Deontay Johnson, and this is where I had my initial projection like way too light on George Pickens. I had him coming in with like a target share around like 24% of the team targets, which looks solid. But then I was looking at, I didn't factor in enough of these splits. He ran 188 routes last season with Deontay Johnson off the field. Uh, and on those routes, uh, he had 28% of the team targets, 2.94 yards per route run. Like a absolutely numbers that project to be like, that's in the conversation of knocking on the doors, wide receiver one production. And then when John Deontay Johnson was on the field for 350 routes, he only had 20% of team targets, 1.68 yards per out run. That's where you see some of the volatility. And then you start to look at some of the games Deontay Johnson missed last year. And week two, 35% team target share, 127 yards and a touchdown against the Cleveland Browns, 23% target share, comes back as four for 75, real solid outing. He did lay a dud in the Texans game. He saw 26% of team targets, but had the three for 25. Then he comes back and has a 33% team target share, uh, 10 targets, 130 yards and a touchdown against the Baltimore Ravens. So, like he had spike weeks against elite defenses too. Like that's the type of talent that we're dealing with. 
we'll see, you know, what it reigns to be seen, how much of an upgrade, you know, Russell Wilson or Justin Fields are with Kenny Pickett and, you know, what happens with this Arthur Smith offense. But the Steelers were already below the Falcons and drop back rate last year. So even if we don't get a lot of influx of routes run for George Pickens, who was already wide receiver 44 and routes run per game last year, I still think that the target share and the usage definitely puts them in a conversation for the upside angle to belong in that conversation with those guys, if all things kind of work out. And I think the price is really good. I, I think he should be treated at least like having like a median outcome very much closer to like DK Metcalf. And he's not, he's drafted well below him too, as well. So George Pickens, definitely one of the guys I've had my eye on as being a potential value, even if he doesn't completely smash because of the situation, I think he's going to be an extreme value where he's being drafted right now. You heard it here, folks. George Pickens, the official wide receiver of the Sharp Football Analysis <laughs> Podcast for 2024. It didn't work out great for us last year. We'll talk actually about that guy here in a second. But uh, I, yeah, I've been on Team George Pickens for a long time. I've been confused by his price for a while. And you brought it all up. And we have obvious concerns about the offensive situation in Pittsburgh. That is, you can't, that is why his price, one of the reasons why his price is so depressed. And right. that is a good reason for it to be depressed. We have obvious concerns about that offense and that quarterback situation, but also you look at that offense and I've talked about this before, what we think that offense is going to do based on the moves they made this off season with the quarterbacks they brought in and trading Deontay Johnson, what we think that they're going to do fits George Pickens Perfectly. 27.9% of his career targets have been at least 20 yards downfield, and he's been able to create after the catch um, in the shorter areas as well throughout throughout his career. Last year, I believe he was 17th in yards after catch uh, per per reception in uh, th on throws 10 or fewer yards downfield. That's off the top of my head. I might be wrong, but I think that's about right. And so you go and look at those things, and you go, okay, he can create after the catch, which we know there's going to be a lot of short targets. We expect there to be a lot of short targets in this. He can get down the field. We expect Russell Wilson and Justin Fields to throw the ball down the field. That's what they do at the second and third rate last season. We expect both of those things to happen. He's the clear number one target in this offense. It fits him. Even if the offense isn't great, I think he's going to be able to do something. And you're getting all of that outside of the top 25 wide receivers. And to me, that's just, it's a no brainer. It's been a no brainer for a long time. My only concern here is that, his draft price is going to start going up as, as rich, the great rich rebar uh, comes around to my, but do you think he will, I don't think he'll jump guys like Metcalf, right? Like, uh, yeah, um, I don't think he gets that high, maybe. but I, I would rather have George Pickens than DK Metcalf. Like there's less target competition. I feel just as, you know, I feel like there's just as much questions about the offense in Seattle. So like, and, and you know, DK Metcalf's already been a guy that's shown us like he can't get over that hump. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, and I, I'm trying to see and remember, um, I, I think about, no, Terry's Terry's below him. I was I had Terry McLaurin's ADP from last year in my head. Terry McLaurin and him is a very interesting kind of conversation to me because I think we think Terry McLaurin got an upgrade as well. And I'm not sure, I'm not, and a quarterback upgrade that is, and I'm not sure how much target competition Jahan Dotson is. I apologize, Penn State legend Jahan Dotson, for saying that, but I, I, Terry McLaurin, I think about him a lot when I'm thinking about George Pickens as well. Those two really stick out to me as guys that maybe we're underestimating the the bump up that they're going to get. And maybe we're underestimating how good they are because I think Terry McLaurin is good. And maybe we're underestimating kind of their their target upside. Those I two just guys think, really I stick can't in think my of brain. like like Pickens. It's interesting. So you think about it from like a dynasty perspective and like it feels like there's not like a lot of excitement about him. Like I always hear people kind of label him like he's Gabe Davis esque. But like think about if we had a guy that had his pedigree performed at Georgia, got drafted with tangible draft capital, has only gotten better two years in the NFL. He's actually been a better player through two years than Drake London has. And like, it feels like just no one cares. So uh, George Pickens is currently on the trade block in one of my dynasty leagues. And I immediately went and tried to trade for him. Um, and I haven't heard back yet, but I will, I offered a first round pick for him next year's first round pick for him. And I'd probably be willing to go higher than that. I, I think you're right. I think this is a very clear, a very clear, um, you know, um, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but a very clear like opportunity to get a player that might be pretty underpriced. Let's talk about a player that is never underpriced. He's always <laughs> appropriately priced. And that is the one, the only Joe Mixon. Um, Joe Mixon is such, he's been so interesting the last few years because he hasn't necessarily been a good real life running back. He's been fine, but he's right. more been an average real life running back. Um, and he's been an average fantasy kind of contributor, but he's also not killed you. 
He's been fine at whatever cost it was to get him. He's been fine. I kind of fall that he, that's exactly what we're going to see this year. He's not going to probably cost you at his current cost, barring an in- injury. But like, I have a hard time getting past that. But you said you moved him up after tears, and I'm really interested in, in kind of why you feel that way. Yeah, I mean, by and large, I do feel um, similarly towards you, except for he's one cheaper than this year. And I think that, that we'll get into a couple, I think, positives for Joe Mixon that could offer him a little more upside. Uh, because the situation, like an overlap, like everything he has in Houston were like the arguments you kind of would hear in Cincinnati, right? Like it was an ascending offense. Uh, you know, th- they were going to score points. He was going to get goal line carries, all these things. And like he just kind of, you know, the, the final numbers for Joe Mixon were always there and they've been there. You know, he has 1,200 yards in five of the past six seasons. But like the the per game stuff and the the, the ceiling weeks were just kind of always fleeting for him. But when... I had to tear these guys up and like I taught we kind of hinted about it in the open when we were talking about the the running backs. They're just really are a finite group of guys that we project to play in good offenses and play three downs, right? And like that's by default. I was like, I'm like kind of we're I was like, man, we're kind of underestimating just like the the scarcity of this arc archetype of running back. And yeah. uh that's kind of where he fits. Cause I don't think a couple of guys fit into that mold. Like we talked about Josh Jacobs. We were gonna potentially talk about Josh Jacobs as like a guy we dropped. And I don't I think there's a teardown for Josh Jacobs really fitting that archetype now. And there is. And you talk about a guy like Alvin Kamara. He's been vultured on the goal line uh, repeatedly by Taysom Hill now for two years. I think you've got a couple of guys like Mixon, Travis Etienne, and Rashad White that no one really loves, but like really are standing out as kind of really good values right now, especially when you open wide receiver heavy. And I think that's the biggest allure of Mixon. Well, one, two, he's like he's potential like leverage on if anything of the Houston passing game doesn't hit because they all go ahead yeah. of him in drafts. But uh Except for now, we're seeing Tank Dell a little bit slide, but uh, and and you could start three, four wide receivers and potentially get a guy like Joe Mixon, which you never could do, like yeah, five six years ago. But uh, let's talk about the situation a little bit. That I think that offers him a little bit more more upside. He's like you said, he's been more of a don't go broke guy. Uh, so since he entered the NFL, sixty four percent of his runs are out of shotgun. Now in the past two years, that's seventy eight percent, by far the most in the NFL. I wrote about this a little bit in the opening free article for the, the, the trends this week that the increase of shotgun in the NFL is actually damaging offenses. Like the under center per stuff, like where you have offensive leverage, where you could, the offense, the defense really doesn't know if you're going to run or pass. That has actually been the most efficient plays in the NFL the past two years through this like kind of little mini depression we've had offensively. And I want to, and I want to jump in on that. And I, and I think you made a, I th- I would have liked you to hit it harder in that in that article, but we talked about it. We were talking about the preview book. Is that is one of the things about uh, Shanahan and Bay offense that I, I tried to make this point. And I made it clumsily because I'm Raymond Summerlin and that's what I do. But like that is one of the things that they do is they really do present this idea that we could be running or passing. Mm-hmm. Like they they're very good at doing that of creating these play action situations, um, you know, and using this kind of indecision against defenses. Which, as you rightly point out, when you're in shotgun, is a little more difficult to do just based on kind of the structure of of the plays and the structure of making play action work out of shotgun. I do think it could work maybe more than people try it, but like out of uh, kind of that I that idea, mm-hmm. and I think it's a really good point especially since as i assume we're going to now talk about the offensive coordinator in tech in houston and, and kind of where he comes from yeah and, and obviously the addition is stefan diggs houston's gonna run a decent amount of 11 personnel and they already ran a lot of 11 personnel when they threw the football last year but they're also when you look at where bobby slow comes from that shanahan tree you know you're getting fullback runs on the field too. I mean, Houston was fifth in the NFL in runs with a fullback last year. Uh, they were fourth in the NFL in rate of runs out of 21 personnel. Uh, we're going to see that fullback on the field. Joe Mixon, for his career, has 20 carries with a with a fullback on the field. Like, it, and you know, we're, we're we're you know this this run scheme is going to be a lot better. And then you look at the offensive line in Houston should be greatly improved based on just yeah. default of staying healthy right like they're just going to have better fortune in, in terms of health this year their most frequent offensive line combination was only on the field for 20 percent of their offensive snaps 
28th in the league. Shaq Mason, the only offensive lineman to play the full season. They only had three other linemen play 10 or more games. Laramie Tunsil's the only other guy I saw on the roster. You know, Kenyon Green missed the entire season. He'll be back. They took Juice Scruggs in the second round last year. He didn't play until week 12. Titus Howard only played seven games. So, and then uh, the other factor is too, is he's getting out of the AFC North. And I talked about this a little bit with Joe Burrow and, and part of like Joe Burrow's like kind of, you know, un, uneasiness for fantasy where he's being drafted is that the Bengals have, have stunk in AFC North games. They actually have a losing record since drafting Joe Burrow in AFC North games. I've talked about Joe Bur Burrow's QB one rate in those games and Mixon's kind of gone along for that ride a little bit. So he's, he's trading the AFC North for the AFC South, which, which has way more opportunities, I think for more less slug fest and, and more di dynamic offense. So, I ended up all those pulling factors like ended up to being where like I ended up moving Joe Mixon up uh, a little bit from where he was. And like I said, if you're starting wide receiver heavy in that bad quadrant, I mean, he looks like a, a, a pretty easy like kind of like bet where he's made on those types of roster builds. I'd like to go back in time and tell my seventh grade football coach that a longtime veteran running back in the NFL had attempted 20 carries with the fullback <laughs> on the field. What a... What a time to be alive. He would he wouldn't even know what to do. He'd be like, what has happened to my beautiful game? Uh it is uh it is interesting. I, I'll say one of the one of my concerns about Mixon, I agree with you. I have no issue with where Mixon is being drafted. I've drafted him on teams that have started wide receiver heavy. It all makes perfect sense to me. If I was pushing back a little bit on Mixon and just maybe playing devil's advocate, I do wonder what the receiving upside is because he mm -hmm. has made a little bit of hay in PPR leagues on receptions. If you go and look at qualifying backs uh, over the last two seasons, he's seventh in receptions per game. That It's not like he's a massive receiving back, but that has been something he does. Uh, CJ Stroud was 30th in RB target rate last year among 32 qualified quarterbacks. Is that because of the running backs he was throwing to, or is that something that's going? we're going to see stick with him? Is that something we're going to see stick with this offense? You wouldn't expect it where, you know, based on where slow it comes from. But that's an interesting part of the Joe Mixon kind of discourse course but ultimately i mean you're not you're not arguing against him where he goes for the reasons you laid out it's like what else are we doing because you mentioned you didn't even bring up james cook which i, I believe james cook is right in that area as well and like you have the same concerns about cook are we going to see cook get touchdowns like there's if you're if you're looking for a guy that you're pretty sure is going to get touches and pretty sure going to get touchdown opportunities in a good offense that is few and far between as we get further, you know, deeper into drafts. And that, that makes it a lot, a lot more difficult. Another yeah. The, guy, the, the other guys in that right. group, like, like I said, like ETN is in that same group, but like he is, his offensive line is significantly worse than, than Houston's objectively when it's healthy. You've got Rashad white who, like you, you, there's there's like a pull down potentially for Tampa in general, right? Like, is, is Tampa even going to have as good an offense as they had last year? And then the other guy I think that's interesting that I know you like as well is Aaron Jones, who kind of fits that mold. Yeah. And we're just waiting to see that kind of like how that quarterback situation like presents itself over the remainder of the summer. But Aaron Jones, a nice little fallback area too. Like, I mean, like I said, if you're in that back quadrant, like those are the types of guys, like you wouldn't have been able to get those guys on those roster builds, which makes them particularly more appealing. Like. Are, are, do you really want to be in those spots and, and be taking like a guy like Xavier Worthy or Jaden Reed versus like one of these guys that you just know is is just going to be like a guy you can plug in when you already have a, a healthy, strong, sturdy wide receiver foundation? Like I find that hard. I find it hard to push the, the click the buttons on those types of wide receivers that are available at those spots than those guys I laid out. So I've been having this kind of internal struggle with what I view as the dead zone running backs. And the the types of running backs that I would normally be that I would normally be jumping in order to get wide receivers, because I've already drafted those wide receivers. By the time mm -hmm. I get to the wide receivers, I would normally jump someone like you mentioned Aaron Jones. I love Aaron Jones at his cost right now. I think Aaron Jones is an underpriced uh, asset as it as it stands right now. Um, and there's possibly I'm wrong about that. It's possible he's old. It's possible he pulls his hamstring again. But I'm I'm feeling really good about where Aaron Jones is. And normally I would think about it and I go, you know, but there are going to be some wide receivers here that I, I'm going to want to target. And now there aren't because I've already drafted four wide receivers right. before, before I get there. <laughs> and so those wide receivers don't exist. And so when you're looking at, when you're looking at where these players are going, not 
to the running back position. And this is kind of what I said about Josh Jacobs. You look at Josh Jacobs as the RB12 and you go, well, that's that's absurd. But then you look at you look at where he's going in just the draft overall and what RB12 means in the draft overall. And I'm pulling it up right now. It's on our site. We have underdog ADP updated on our site. And he's going around uh, Keenan Allen, Jaden Reed, Calvin Ridley. And I'm suddenly like, you know what? I'm I'm probably not drafting Josh Jacobs there because I am no I don't really I like Marshawn mm-hmm. Lloyd I have some concerns about what his ultimate upside is and how many passes he can catch but then I look at it and I say well you know what what is the opportunity cost that you're actually giving up here with those types of wide receivers and then you keep going down the list we get to Aaron Jones is you know because I really like Aaron Jones Aaron Jones goes after Keon Coleman Aaron Jones goes after Jackson Smith and Jigba you know what I'm saying like I. Right. You can make upside cases for both those wide receivers, too. I'm not saying that both those wide receivers mm-hmm. don't make sense. Both of those guys make a ton of sense, and I get why people are drafting him. He goes after Lad McConkey. That one, I I have a much tougher time making the Lad McConkey case than I do those other two. But he goes after Brian Thomas. Like, there are a lot of guys here, and I go, you know what? At this, Deontay Johnson, at this point, I'm like, those aren't the those aren't the same wide receivers you used to draft when the dead zone running backs were being drafted. You used to be drafting wide receivers going the wide receiver like twenty five, and you used to be drafting George Pickens where the where the dead zone running backs are going. That's not what's happening this year, and that means we have to change how we view this kind of part of the running back position. I think. Yeah, yeah, and that's been like my the inverse has been true about guys like we talk about like London and Marvin Harrison. It's like it feels rich based on where you're like, oh, I'm up in the, at the one-two turn and I have to take these guys. And then you realize, well, they are the wide receiver 12 or the wide receiver 13. And th- that was typically a spot where you'd see like the wide receiver five or wide receiver six go, right? So you have to get over like that yeah. mental that mental roadblock. And then that's where, like I said, like tiering guys helps out a lot. <laughs> yeah, or you can just go draft at FFPC as I learned. Yes. As I learned this week. And it because will shift in like home leagues and stuff. Yeah, yeah. We'll see it shift. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. I also think that when we're talking about like the trends, like the articles we put out, this week on the site like it's showing that like the those elite run like all of it ties together that there's we've seen this shift where wide receivers are rightly being drafted ahead of running backs because we still see that archetype i'm not pushing against it either like i'm not pushing Mm -hmm. back on what's happening at the beginning of drafts either it's just it's kind of where we are now and that's that's kind of the i think the overall point and why these trends articles that you're putting out this week are you know so important and so good all right, let's move on to Rashid Shahid, another player that you moved up. You have a lot of interesting stuff in there about Shahid. He's obviously a very interesting player. What specifically about him has you moving him higher than you expected him to be? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things. One, obviously, is the, you know, the his splits with and without Michael Thomas and, and the Saints really, you know, kind of not doing a lot to address the wide receiver position in this offense because they probably, again, because they hired someone for the Shanahan tree, are not going to play a lot of 11 personnel this year. Uh, probably not nearly as much as people think, you know, they at Cedric Wilson was really the only like viable veteran they had, they draft Bub means in the draft. So it's kind of a clear runway for Rashid Shahid to be the, the clear wide receiver too in this offense, in this Clint Kubiak offense, which now changes things dramatically from an offense that was just so stale, right? Like, you know, this is, this is a saints offense that last year was dead last in the NFL in rate of play action. They were dead last in rate of pre stat motion And to kind of give you like some top down like ideas, like, you know, pre-snap motion roughly adds 10% to a wide receiver yards per out run play action, 31% to a wide receiver yards per out run. Uh, We only have Kubiak one year calling plays in the NFL. That was back in 2021 when he was the Vikings. But in that year, the Vikings were 12th in the NFL in pre-snap motion, 18th in use of play action. Like those are massive rates and being dead last in the NFL. Um, And basically what that that offense that the Dennis Allen and Pete Carmichael tried to run last year would just ask the Saints wide receivers to to win in ways that just didn't have a lot a high success rate. They were tasked to win vertically downfield in the deep ball. Uh, Rashid Shahid, of all wide receivers that ran four or more routes last season, he ran the highest rate of go routes. 30% of his routes were go routes. 32% of his targets as a byproduct of that were on 20 yards or further downfield, which is the third highest rate in the NFL last year among all wide receivers at 50 or more targets. That's like a hard way to win in terms of consistency and being viable and having production. So I think those two Saints wide receivers get a bump. Obviously, Alave is already rich. But you look at Rashid Shahid and where he's going, I don't think he's nearly moved up enough. I outright think he's a better draft pick than Jamison Williams, who 
Jamison Williams is more hopium based. He's been a better player the last two years. He's earned targets at a higher clip than Jamison Williams. He's like I said, are already been more productive. Whereas Jamison Williams, like I said, we're just kind of like infusing this, like, well, you know, he plays for the lions. Like we're hoping this, this go work out. Uh, he was a first round pick. So, and, I mean, you know, hopefully, yeah, but I mean, Shahid is definitely a guy I think is 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 a guy that belongs. One, he should be inside the top fifty wide receivers. He is for me, uh, for sure. But and he's like a nice, even though he's climbed, you've seen some people give him steam. Uh, I don't think he's moved up enough th- throughout the off season. Yeah, I'm with you hundred uh, percent on Shahid, and I've been in on Shahid. Uh, his profile makes sense, and you mentioned with Jamison Williams. With Jamison Williams, we're hoping he's the number three target. With Rashid Shahid, we're pretty sure he's the number two target. As mm-hmm. as things stand, we'll see what happens with At Perry. Obviously, there's you know there's lots of things that can happen here, but I think we're pretty sure about about Shahid. I am interested in what happens with you mentioned that what we saw last year wasn't they weren't giving Derek Carr a lot of easy throws down the field but you also look back at Derek Carr's career and his downfield throwing you know off target rate hasn't been great um last year he's 23rd out of 32 qualifying quarterbacks uh (laughs) the year before but if you go back like two years so I did I did two years he was 27th out of 45 qualifying so that even goes back to you know before that when we're when we're dealing with when we're dealing with you know Derek Carr but then I went and I looked at the list with Shahid so Shahid's air yards per target last year was around 15 yards so I put the cutoff there and Shahid's inaccurate target rate on throws 15 air yards or more last season was 35.7 percent which is the 10th highest among 80 qualifying receivers. But then I scrolled to the bottom of that list. And do you know who the bottom four players? So the the players with the lowest inaccurate target rate on throws 15 yards or more. So the 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 wide receivers who are getting the most accurate targets as a percentage 15 yards or more down the field. It's a really interesting list. The fourth, the fourth uh, on that list is Jalen Waddell. The second and third on that list are Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel. And first on that list is Tyree Kill. Just something interesting to think about in the context of this coaching situation and yeah. how, like you said, making players win difficultly down the field is going to lead to an increase in off-target rate from the quarterback and a, and a decrease in completion rate and all of those things. And if we think Shahid is able to get downfield and earn targets downfield, and now he's in the system that we've now seen with two quarterbacks that you know, I like to attack of Iloa. I like Brock Purdy. I don't think we think either of them are elite quarterbacks, but they were able to do this for their wide receivers. Maybe we're going to see a a more impressive Derek Carr down the field if they're able to kind of institute a similar similar scheme. It's just an interesting. Yeah. When I scroll to the bottom of the list, I go, "This is fascinating that these are these are the guys down here." And the other thing we're not factoring into that I said is is you know one thing we don't do with wide receivers enough. I don't think is think about the contingency value. And if anything were yeah. to happen to Chris Olave. I mean, who is now the number one wide receiver in this offense? Yeah, no, it's an interesting, it's an interesting spot. We're running out of time. I want to go through the next two a little bit quickly, but I do want to yeah, talk yeah. about them because I think they're interesting. Tajay Spears is really interesting to me um, because of, and you you mentioned it in in your write up for the running back tiers, which is again is available on Sharp Football Analysis. He, where he, the way that this offensive coaching staff has talked about. Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears and their interchangeability is really, really fascinating to me, especially since Spears was, frankly, a, a better running back when he was given the opportunities last year. Now, there are contingencies there. Pollard was coming off an in- injury. Spears' usage would lead to more efficient opportunities based on how he was mm-hmm. being used there with Derrick Henry. But it is interesting that it seems like the coaching staff views these two guys as you know, basically interchangeable. Yeah, and I've been waiting for more offenses to try maybe this type of approach, right? Because we've seen compartmentalized backfields start to happen across the NFL for for over a decade, right? But typically, it's like the Jameer Gibbs, David Montgomery type of thing, right? Yeah. Where it's like you've got guys in, in like these, you know, kind of like you know pigeonholed roles. I've been waiting for a team to just say like, what if we just had a bunch of the same dudes and like we could just run our offense? And like, it wouldn't matter. Like we wouldn't give no tells to a defense. Uh, we could just do exactly what we want to set out to do every play. And that's kind of what they have in Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears. And we've already seen Nick Holtz, the new offensive coordinator, uh, you know, under Brian Callahan and come out and basically refer to like, these guys are going to be interchangeable. His exact quote was like, they're going to be interchangeable. And immediately that jumps out to me and saying that, all right, Tajay Spears now goes from a guy that that already had handcuff value, but now he might inherently have standalone value too as well, 
Like he might be flex worthy on his own when this is split. Then you've got more contingency upside because when you look at some of the other guys, like he kind of carries an ADP, uh, they are guys that are more like contingency based. Like, you know, Trey Benson is probably not going to have a lot of flex value until we get the three week stretch. You know, uh, James Conner misses games. Uh, you know, the, the, the and it, Jaleel McLaughlin, right. Is another one of these guys like Jaleel McLaughlin, his standalone value is probably going to be very fleeting. Uh, even if a guy gets hurt, uh, a lot of these Blake Corum, right? Like his, he's a con- complete contingency value running back. Like all these guys kind of go around Tajay Spears, but Tajay Spears is probably going to have a lot more standalone value than what he had last year. You look at last year, the Titans only ran the ball 28.8% of the time when Spears was on the field. Like he was literally used as that, inter- that, that guy that came in after they ruined two downs, handing them off to Derrick Henry, basically, uh, and, and had, had the run against light boxes. And, um, So, I mean, that's basically like the short end of it, though. And you look at like with Brian Callahan, you know, coming over plays, we're going to get a a huge seismic shift in terms of uh, offensive identity. I've talked about the Titans a lot. We talked about it with Mike Clay a couple weeks ago. It's going to be a team that's going to be 11 personnel based. So even if you want to highlight the efficiency stuff that you mentioned being more kind of driven by the game situations that he got his carries. That's going to be a lot. They're going to face a lot of light boxes anyways because the loss of Derrick Henry and just running a lot more 11 personnel, they're going to dictate box box counts. So, yeah, Tajay Spears was a guy that definitely stood out to me as a guy that I wanted to get up and move up, uh, you know, in in ranks and be aggressive on him. You know, it's it's a bummer because, like, I think you can make a lot of the things – for Tony Pollard being a lot more successful this year than last year, especially a healthier version of Tony Pollard. But the fact that Spears is cheaper than Tony Pollard, he just finds a lot more of my rosters. I I just, as an aside and Trey Benson's ADP has fallen, but the fact that Benson is still only going 15 picks after James Conner is uh, absurd. Like it's at James Conner. And we know, we know James Conner is going to miss four games. We know that that's fine. (laughs) We know that that's going to happen, but James Conner is is one of the more underdrafted what running backs that we that we have right now, and I'm I'm happy to stack him on a bunch of those wide receiver heavy rosters and just see what happens. The last guy we want to talk about here is uh, the former face of this podcast, uh, Christian Watson, uh, who you you moved up. Again, we were burned last year, but you moved him up after the tears. There's no way he can hurt us again, right? There's no way that this happens again that he hurts us, Rich. <laughs> you know, uh, it's maybe, maybe, maybe we're just gluttons for punishment, you know, but, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, you I look at know for punishment. It, yeah. I mean, you look at this off season, it's been very interesting for Christian Watson. You know, he goes to the university of Wisconsin, uh, you know, to, to do that, you know, study on his hamstrings, you know, Stefania Bell talked about that when I did the podcast with her about a month ago. And she talked about like how like that, that, that university got like the $4 million grant, you know, from the NFL to study and prevention of hamstring injuries. And, you know, the report from that visit was that he had a 20% difference in muscle strength between his right and left legs, which I don't really know how that works. It reminds me of uh, what was the M night Shyamalan movie where the dude is just lifting uh, weights with just one arm. Uh, gosh, it's, uh, it's a, do you want to know, do you want to know a fun, you want to know a fun fact about me in that vein is that my left foot is a size 12 and a half and my right foot's a size 11 and finding shoes is a hell of a thing to do. Anyway, continue. <laughs> but they, they said now the report is right now that they have it closer now to it's an eight, eight to 10% difference, which is yeah. basically half of what it was. But so even though we've got to take a leap of faith on like the, the, the Packers are managing and what Christian Watson are managing this thing. But like, we've seen this with other players like Keenan Allen, specifically to start his career, a little bit of Mike Evans that had some chronic hamstring stuff and kind of get past it uh, for the remainder of their careers. And the thing about it is the most though, is that anytime Christian Watson's played, football at full strength he's been really good and was that again last year uh you know we saw it last year uh you know before re-injuring re-injuring his hamstring in week 13 he was on just a massive stretch there where he scored four touchdowns he had the, the monster thanksgiving game he was one of the few wide receivers that was absolutely just roasting the chiefs Last year, the actual game he got hurt, he had seven for 71 and two touchdowns against the Chiefs. Uh, The first game back where he played even more than half the team snaps, he had 91 yards, led the team in receiving. When he was on the field for 270 routes last season, he was targeted a team high 23% of the time. Um, when weeks five through 13, he was healthy before re-injury, he led the team with 49 targets and four touchdowns. Uh, there were four 159 passing plays last year 
where Green Bay had all of him, Romeo Dobbs, and Jaden Reed on the field at the same time. And on those plays, Christian Watson led the team with 26% of the team targets, 2.11 yards per route run. And we talk about money targets a lot. We talk about those those targets that are rich in the fantasy fat. We do. We try to bring the high fat targets. Yeah, the the high cholesterol (laughs) targets. Christian Watson only ran a route on 43% of the team dropbacks last year, but he had 14 targets in the end zone on those plays. For some context, Romeo Dobbs had 17 targets, the entire end zone targets on the year for the Packers and led the team. Jaden Reed only had nine. Dontavian Wicks only had three. That was with Christian Watson only playing 43% of the team dropbacks. Uh, 26% of his targets were in the end zone, which is the highest rate of any wide receiver that had 50 or more targets. That rate would level out but we saw his rookie season he was a touchdown producer like we've seen him so like when you're talking about taking guys in the area where he goes his touchdown upside especially paired with like a guy that people are already in on 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 jordan love and the packers have enough wide receivers i think to, to manage his snaps appropriately too his upside i think per target is just greater than no guys that he goes around which by default i want our gamers to move him up and, and, and aggressively play him, especially when you talking about being able to get him as your wide receiver four, your wide receiver five flex option, that type of guy, because he just offers a lot more upside than those guys like him versus lad McConkey, right? Like his, his, his ceiling outcome is just higher. A guys like Keon yeah. Coleman, these rookie wide receivers. So although we, it's been burnt and I know people are going to roll their eyes and they're going to say, rich, we're doing this shit again. Yeah, man, we are. We are. Here we go again. It's it's the meme because he's been that good of a player that he warrants that type of aggressiveness when people are out on him. Yeah, I'm not pushing back at all. And the other thing that I'll say is that the price combination of him and Jordan Love is very appealing if you're trying to stack in in best ball formats. Um it is it's it's really appealing. And then obviously, you know, you can you can go later with dubs or one of the tight ends or Dontavian Wicks. And that combination of just bypassing Jaden Reed as part of that stack and then going to those guys because a lot of the a lot of the bull cases you're making for Christian Watson are bear cases for Jaden Reed. Um, that's kind of right. the way the way that it goes together. And I, I think that that's very interesting that you could get Jordan Love and Watson and Dubs, or Jordan Love and Watson and Wicks, or Jordan Love and Watson and Musgra- Musgrave. And I think that that probably isn't going to be on as many rosters as maybe it otherwise would have been if we if we weren't that worried about Watson's hamstring. So I'm very interested in that I have a I have a, quite a few of those. All right, that's it for us. We got to get out of here. Remember, we're going to be back. Rich and I are going to be doing this pretty much every Thursday until until the Super Bowl at 11.30 Eastern live. Make sure you go and check it live. Make sure you subscribe to the audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to have a lot more content coming up. Rich brought up a bunch of the guests we've already had. Go back in our feed. If you haven't been paying attention over the last month and a half, we've had so many really great guests over the last month and a half. Go and check that out. A lot of timeless conversations in there. Remember, the Sharp Football Preview Book is available at Sharp Football Analysis, sharp.football, $29.99, early bird pricing, not going to last for much longer. Make sure you go and check that out. Check out the Sharp Football Draft Kit. A ton of great information. We've talked about a lot of it already on this podcast from Rich. There's going to be more and more and more pretty much every day for the rest of the offseason. We're going to have an article from Rich available on the site. So make sure you go and check that out. And uh, we'll be back to talk with you real soon.